Okay, so welcome everyone to this online migration seminar on the impact of telepresent technologies on the placement of a Syrian on the, on the place attachment of Syrian refugees in the Netherlands. I am very happy to have with us today Mohammed Khalif, um, who some of you who are in the room now will have already known. He is actually a sworn translator and interpreter from Arabic to English and English to Arabic. Um, and he is also experienced in, in teaching languages. He currently teaches Arabic at Maastricht University and was also previously a researcher at the Migration and Development Research Group at UNU Merit. He holds a master's in media st studies from Maastricht University and previously worked for the United Nations Relief um, and Work Agency in Syria for over a decade. So he has plenty of experience in the field. Very excited to also hear about the this, this situation of Syrians in the Netherlands. So Mohammed, I pass it over to you to take the floor. Just for everyone to know, there'll be about a 30 minute presentation and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion but feel free if you want as we go along to already start to ask questions in the chat. All right, Mohammed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Melissa, for introduction and uh, for hosting this. And hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today. Without any further delay, I will uh, share my screen. And let's uh, start with the presentation. Can you see my screen? So telepresence, I'm sorry, I will be looking this way because the big screen in my room is here. So just FYI. So telepresence technologies and its relation uh, to place attachment uh, of the Syrian refugees in the Netherlands. Sorry, Mohammed, could you just um, put it on full screen or in presentation mode? Uh, it is. Um... On our screen, it is. It's we see the presentation, but not in presentation um... mode. Maybe because it's linked to Let me check the, because it's connected to another screen, so I'm afraid. I think you just have to go in the display settings and change the display because now we see it in present like in your presentation mode with the next slide and the notes. I think if you go up to display settings. Oh, okay. I think there you might be able to. Yeah, so swap presenter view and slideshow view. Yeah, there we go. Now we see it correctly. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so this uh, study was part of my uh, master uh, thesis on media studies at Maastricht University. It was conducted in 2018. And uh, it was uh, qualitative research. I conducted 10 semi-structured interviews with 10 Syrian refugees residing in the area of Maastricht. Uh, the sample group was bias for uh, reasons related to bias. Uh, after uh, checking the uh, literature review of previous studies, uh, it suggests that uh, the existence of social networks um, family uh, in the place, either here or in Syria, back in Syria, might affect the place attachment of the uh, Syrian refugees. And therefore, I chose uh, the group to be living with uh, family members, living without family members, and living with in a camp or living in their own house. So, the, as it says here, it refers to them. So, correspondents were living in their own private homes alone without a family in the Netherlands. Three of them, uh, they lived uh, in private homes with their families. Two refugees lived in the camp alone, and one refugee lives in uh, the camp with her family. Uh, they were females and males, age range between 19 years old and the uh, late 30s. And of course, the interviews were conducted in Arabic language and particularly in Syrian dialect and translated directly to English. So, uh, to understand more about the 
context, we need to define first some concepts and uh, terminology. So we start by what is place attachment. Place attachment in general refers to the relation between a person and a place. This relation implies uh, many factors, including experiences in the place, uh, memories, symbolism of the place, uh, activities in the place, and uh, periods of time spent in the place. Uh, scholars agreed upon uh, defining the term as an affective relation that connects individuals with specific places where they tend to remain close to for multiple reasons, including the feeling of safety, security, comfort, and satisfaction. Also, it can be uh, named as sense of place, community attachment, and place attachment. All these terminologies uh, can be narrowed down to place attachment. And that here, uh, I find very interesting, and it can also uh, reflect what is the seminar about. Over duration of our lives, we each develop a rhythm and a routine in our use of space and in our relation with the places of our lives that provide a sense of being in place. We gradually come to wear our environment like a glove. As with increasing familiarity, it almost literally becomes part of our persona. The author here uh, implying that a place can be part of our personality with the passage of time, with the passage of experiences and so on. Uh, why people develop attachment to place? It has many uh, drivers of place attachment, including uh, person awareness of that the place offers security and safety. Uh, as a person's home, a person's city, a person's village is a place where he or she uh, feels safe in a normal, of course, normal context. Secure, they have their connections, they have their uh, uh, sources. And of course, it's a well of resources necessary for survival, such as food and shelter. Your home, when you go home, you feel home sweet home. Like it's uh, the place we, where you uh, go out of your uncomfort zone to your comfort zone. So it has the food, it has the shelter, it has your things inside. So this is also one of the reasons why people attach to the place. And of course, here we're talking about place as home, physical home, and place as a city or a village or a community that you live in. So the geographical aspect of the place and the physical aspect. Also the feeling of being able to achieve goals. Uh, also during the literature review, I came across a lot of studies saying that uh, people tend to feel uh, more supported and facilitated to achieve their goals, to uh, climb the ladder of success. That's also thanks to their places with the support of social network in their places. Of course, also the feeling of continuity. Uh, that's also a big debate. That's uh, many scholars uh, are that a person, especially those who live longer periods of time in their uh, places, for these uh, people who uh, were born in a place and continue their most of their life in their place, uh, they they uh, develop special type of attachment that this place represents their continuous self. They started as children. They were uh, like without any accomplishment. They grew. They studied. They're uh, married. All these uh, linking the past to the future to the present. That means the continuous of the person. And also places are linked to important events and even symbolized places. Uh, as always, uh, we do things, our experiences happen in a place that's normal, natural. And for big, uh, big uh, events in our lives, uh, the place becomes like a symbol of, I met uh, my wife in this place. This place has a certain uh, sentimental value to me. It symbolizes a uh, certain event. Or some people uh, find like the, the place where they started their project, they started their job, they built their house. So places has also symbolic uh, meaning. Now also we cannot uh, study place attachment uh, without mentioning mobility, especially in this context. 
mobility here, we are talking about mobility in two uh, ways, mobility as physical and mobility as mediated. The physical mobility includes all normal and traditional ways of mobility, such as traveling by train, by uh, car, by flights, and uh, the mediated one, virtual mobility, which is more the topic of this seminar. Virtual mobility, which we all now enjoy with our phones, as simple as that. Virtual mobility means you are uh, able to be in a place virtually using a screen, using a medium, which is uh, internet, video calling, and uh, so on. And uh, in connection to mobility, place attachment, as uh, discussed by many scholars, can take two forms. People attach to the place as routes or as routes. So, especially those who grew up in a place and spent uh, long periods of time in their places, uh, they attach a form of uh, connection and attachment to the place as routes because the place refers to their home, uh, where they spend longer uh, periods of their time. Uh, they recognize the place as. Uh, the place of uh, they grow up, the connection, the social uh, life they have, and the experiences uh, they experience during their life. Versus blind uh, people and traditional mobility uh, can uh, develop attachment to places as routes, which, for example, a person uh, did their PhD in the UK for four years, then move back to their homes. This place symbolizes uh, achievement of goals for these people, and they develop certain attachment to this place as route. This route can be also physical and the uh, metaphoric meaning of route to, towards success or towards the goal. Now we move to the meaning of telepresence technologies and to understand Telepresence, we, we better understand first what is presence itself. Presence uh, refers to physical being in a place, in all the full meaning of the word. Present in a school, that means your body is there physically. You can see the walls, you can recognize all the facilities, and you can touch and feel that's the presence. And it's not dependent on any medium. It's just the presence of you as simple as that. Versus telepresence, it refers to the experience of one's virtual presence in a remote place. This includes using a medium. You need a medium to be physically, uh, virtually present in a physical place that is far from you. And that's the term telepresence. And here, telepresence technologies include modern digital means of communication, such as video calling applications and software. Now, uh, this Zoom is a telepresence technology, uh, WhatsApp video calling, even audio calling can be also considered as telepresence technology. Some scholars also argue that telepresence as a term is not new. It's not linked only to the video, audio, uh, new technologies or digital technologies. It's as old as uh, traditional letters. They, they argue that uh, receiving and sending traditional letters written by hand is a form of telepresence when you see the ink that was written in a very far place in front of your eyes, you see the handwriting of a person, this is a form of a telepresence. Now we go to the strengths and weaknesses of uh, telepresence technologies. First and foremost, these telepresence technologies, one can argue that they even provide more uh, senses in, involved and in a higher uh, quality sometimes more than real life, thanks to the 4K and high definitions, audio and video and uh, 3D technologies and uh, 360 uh, cameras and all this. So this is one of the advantages of uh, telepresence technologies, more sense involved nowadays vision and hearing. And I read an article that they're trying to make a scent that goes through some digital equipment is in the progress. But yeah, they're, they're uh, working on that. Uh, also, it, it provides real-time communication in a far away places. Uh, for example, 
we're sitting here in Massif. We can uh, check the website of uh, the live web camps in Washington, D.C., and we see the squares, the areas, lifetime, uh, real life. So it's also uh, bringing more realities, more locations to one screen in, in just real time. And another thing is multiple location at the same time, a person now, thanks to these telepresence technologies can be in many places at the same time using Zoom, using uh, Skype. You can have five, 10 participants showing their surroundings with cameras and you're there at the same time. However, the weakness points now is, first of all, the concept of availability. In real life, in, in presence, normal presence, uh, a person is available or not available. So uh, a person can be here and cannot disappear in a second. Leaving a place, a physical place, uh, requires uh, standing up, saying I'm leaving. Uh, it, it happens in, in a context versus in, in uh, telepresence technologies, one can encounter a drop in the internet, a cut in the electricity, and you disappear in a second. Maybe while you're speaking, you just disappear. This is one of the weakness points of telepresence, as argued by many uh, authors. Also, uh, another point is the lack of accuracy of human eye contact. Uh, many scholars argue that the position of a camera in our uh, phones or in our uh, computers or tablets uh, cannot give the real uh, eye contact as the normal. Uh, sometimes also when a person looking at the screen itself, that will uh, give a different angle from looking at the exact lens of the camera. And that's uh, argued to be a break in the human eye contact. Uh, also, Arguments about absence of some uh, senses like smell, like touch. It's, uh, yeah, you cannot uh, utilize all your five senses. So it's also not like a uh, real uh, presence. Now we go directly to the impact of uh, these telepresence technologies, video calling in our case, on the refugees, Syrian refugees attachment to homeland. Uh, one main finding of the study was that these telepresence technologies impact the sense of place of these refugees, how they feel the place, how they uh, perceive the place, the feeling and, uh, of, and the connectedness to the remote place, which is their homeland and in this case, Syria. One of the main questions in the interviews was, where do you feel yourself during the video call of home? Uh, it was uh, actually uh, interesting and sometimes surprising to hear the answers. Uh, the same person, the same respondent can give multi-answers. So it's difficult to say five of them said this. It's like they have mixed uh, observations and feelings towards this. But uh, many of them said, I feel there. There means Syria. This quote from one respondent, uh, give an example. I will tell you an example and you may laugh. When I make video call with my family while they were eating, I can imagine and feel the taste in my mouth of what they are eating. I can see the skin that tells that the food is hot. I can feel about everything there during video calls. I just feel that I'm there and I forget during video calls to think about anything happening around me in the room where I sit. I become isolated, or you can say taken, taken from here, taken to there. I feel only there. Of course, this is, uh, I think, a immense uh, experience of this uh, respondent. But one can argue also that these telepresence technologies have the power to, four seconds, four minutes, move a person in the feeling to feel fully in a place he or she is calling. So. One of the findings that the, this uh, these uh, technologies impacted it's, it enhanced the the feeling of the place and the attachment of the homeland of the refugees. Uh, some others said, I "Don't feel here. I don't feel there." I was, uh, they show some kind of confusion. 
of the place. And of course, it was always uh, mentioned that this confusion will last from seconds to just short minutes. So just to highlight that. And they arrange uh, for the in their response between like, I just felt seconds, but some people say it's just, uh, I felt uh, all the all like that. So this uh, would also, I could myself in a different place, not here, not there, but in a, cer in a third place, unknown place. You know, like when you're dreaming, you're not here and not there, you're not anywhere, you don't have a physical place during a video call. It is a little bit difficult to explain, but like, as I told you, physically, I'm not existed in here, I'm online. Um, also here, one can argue that these telepresence technologies uh, created a new place, which, which people now recognize as online. Uh, I'm meeting my family online, not at their place, not in my place, it's online. For the normal uh, conversation, we all understand, yeah, online, of course, but in the context of these interviews where really uh, the interviewees show confusion, uh, that's like online is itself a place. And the third, also the third theme in this regard is some uh, respondents mentioned that the perception of the medium is different for them now. Now they, they uh, perceive the medium, which is the phone or the video call as, as a place itself and they care about it. The following, my mother is the most important and close person in my life. When we meet on video calls, we go deep in our feelings and we neglect the surroundings. I feel like I'm holding her in my pocket, which is the phone here. Where, uh, wherever I go, we meet there in the phone. I don't feel I'm here nor there. I only feel that I'm with her in the space of the phone. Not because it's expensive, but because my mother exists in it. So in, in this case, the, the phone, the medium, has a meaningful uh, position. Uh, it symbolizes a place where uh, the person and the mother meets. And they uh, just uh, care too much now about this phone just because it is now for them a place that uh, holds the mother. Also, uh, the interviews, data that are derived from the interviews, uh, highlighted that the attachment of people in the place, the social dimension of place attachment, plays a big role in, in their attachment to the place itself. Uh, previously, in, in uh, previous studies, uh, place attachment can take three dimensions, which is the personal and psychological dimension, the social dimension and the object dimension. The personal is the personal experience in the place versus the uh, social dimension means the attachment is to the people in the place. As long as the people are in the place, then the person is attached to the place versus if the place lost its residence or the social uh, capital there, the attachment to the place drops down. And here, this example uh, I, uh, shows uh, this argument more. When I first came to the Netherlands, I was very addicted to WhatsApp video calls. It was like my only way to see my family, whom I miss very much. I called them two times every week. Now things change. Most of my friends have left here, and my family now lives here in Maastricht. I see them almost every day, and together we call them. People in Damascus, maybe twice or so every month. So the, the amount of calls drops from kind of every day to twice a month. Sure, we love to see our city. We belong to there, but now we are together. This proves that the social uh, capital, the social network in the place play a big role in the attachment to the place itself. Also, the findings uh, and the impact in general of telepresence technologies on, on the place attachment of Syrian refugees include inclusion, and accomplish, accomplishing social duties and remote participation. Video calling, uh, if, I, if I call it like that, video calling uh, powered uh, these refugees to be included, to avoid 
uh, exclusion from their communities, which are in Syria. Uh, I, I have many uh, examples from the interviews. One of them was always mentioning how uh, he would like to be always included in the family decisions. Uh, he mentioned an example of uh, his family wanted to buy a house, and he he has a say in that, even though he is far away. They took the video for him real time. They show him the house, and he uh, gave his word of approval that they can buy the house. So he was included even in decision making for the family. Uh, thanks to these technologies, these refugees still feel included in their uh, families and in, in their social uh, sphere. Also, accomplishing social duties. Uh, it was very interesting hearing uh, some of the respondents say, I paid my sister a visit, which uh, in, the, in the traditional meaning you go, but in, in their case, she pays her visit on the video call, and it's like the norm for them now. Uh, her sister has a baby, and uh, she pays her a visit to congratulate her. That was all on video, and they are satisfied, satisfied with that. So social duties, uh, inclusion, decision making is all uh, facilitated by these. Also enhanced togetherness, social family ties. Another example from the interviews, uh, a girl was talking about how Ramadan for uh, Syrians and in general Muslims is a big event. And after Ramadan comes the sugar feast, which kind of equal Christmas uh, in Europe and how they will uh, not miss the gathering of sugar feast with her family. So she spent uh, hours uh, on a video call just with the family and hearing them and talking to them. So she also uh, was included in the social gathering. Uh, of course, the Brazil culture and language, these technologies also facilitate that. Uh, many of the respondents highlighted that uh, they don't want to be cut from their culture. They want to keep in touch. They want to uh, keep the language. Some of them, they want to keep the dialect of their area uh, by talking always with their family. And uh, some of them highlighted that even their friends want their kids to be connected. And the only way of connection is not video calling. So keeping the heritage and the culture. Uh, also noted in the interviews that uh, there are higher attachment to symbolic places. This derives its uh, symbolism from personal experiences, memories, sentimental incidents, culture, history, and so on. Uh, I have many examples from the interview. One of them, a uh, uh, person was talking about a garage where his father first taught him how to fix uh, bikes. And he always uh, uh, like loved this place and always asked his mother to show the place on the video calling. And for him, this place symbolizes uh, growth, uh, father, fatherhood, all these aspects. Another girl talked about uh, the castle of Aleppo. And uh, in that uh, regard, she was telling me how she most of the time uh, watch videos and on, on uh, social media about how Castle of Aleppo now doing. It was bombarded partially and she follows up on that. This castle, she talked a lot about it. That is a symbol of the city, a symbol of Aleppo people. And uh, that she, uh, yeah, she wants always to show her friends, show other people that this is the symbol of our city. This is, uh, part of our culture and history. So also, uh, the, the place attachment is affected by the symbolic uh, meaning of the place. Also, changes in the social structure or physical appearance of a place can uh, result in this attachment. And this was also mentioned by some of the interviewees that, uh, for example, when the family left and no more friends, the place lost its value for, for them. And the amount of calls dropped from two per day or two per uh, week to uh, one, two per month. And also another uh, interview, we talked about how uh, he saw her his uh, house partially destroyed and the appearance of the house disturbed. 
So he doesn't have any desire to uh, know more about the area. He lost interest. Of course, this is deeper than a place attachment uh, nor in normal cases because it's a context of war and destruction. But it also shows that if the appearance of the place is different, sometimes it affects attachment. And finally, here we talk about uh, the impact of telepresence technologies on refugees' social integration in the Netherlands. Uh, these four points are uh, intertwined, uh, one lead to another. So, based on the interviews and based on my personal observation, uh, Syrians in the Netherlands uh, kind of live in their own social bubble. And that social bubble is mainly Syrian. They have relatives, they have friends in the Netherlands, physically existing there. And in the uh, art of telepresence is they call every day, they contact everyday people in Syria. So in other words, they are building social networks with Syrians. They speak Arabic and they keep this uh, circle within their culture. So one can argue they can uh, you look like they're living in a virtual Syria within the Netherlands, physically with their relatives and friends here, and via telepresence, calling and uh, contacting video calls every every uh, now and then. So uh, they they make uh, themselves satisfied in the social meaning, and that will lead to lack of motivation to build social networks with locals, and that was also expressed during the interviews. One of them said, uh, when asked about uh, how are you doing with social uh, life in the Netherlands, did you make new friends with locals? And they said, uh, I don't need to do that. I have already my social network. I have already my people who are who share uh, my culture, my traditions, and my language. So I feel satisfied socially. I don't have to uh, make new friends, and that's the reason why they socially not. Uh, well, high level of integration. And that also leads to the next point, which is these telepresence technologies consequently impact their uh, language learning process. Uh, I would not say it hinders, but in some cases it slows it down, especially when we don't make new uh, friends, we don't mingle with locals, we don't talk to locals, that will consequently affect your language uh, process because in languages you start with the books, schools, then when you need to really learn the language, the speaking part and the listening, you need to mingle with the locals and here the missing circle. Which also makes uh, the next point that these telepresence technologies consequently overall impact overall feeling of belongingness uh, to the new uh, when you are talking all the time or most of the time with your Syrian or uh, from Syria people, talking with your family online and uh, doing your traditions within the Netherlands, but it's small Syria in the Netherlands, uh, your belonging, uh, feeling of belonging to the new home will be uh, very slow or will be kind of broken. So, uh, yeah. These are the findings of uh, how the reverse impact of telepresence technologies on the refugees' social integration. Uh, yeah, that was uh, the main points of the of the thesis and the study. Thank you very much for listening, and let's uh, have some discussion now on questions. Great, thank you so much, Mohammed. This is much, much appreciated. Um, I will open the floor now to comments, questions. I mean, maybe some of you also in uh, the meeting now have worked with similar groups and can also bring in your own perspective. So I open the floor now. Well, maybe while people are still thinking, I can. I can ask a question. Please. So, uh, of course, you did this research for your master's thesis, and I'm wondering in how far you um, kept in touch with any of your respondents or if during your discussions with them more generally, they talked more about um, 
how this how the effects changed for them over time. So I know you talked about it a little bit, right? Um, but maybe you can expand a little bit more on that. Yeah, thank you. Very good point because uh, one of the respondents actually later on we have a work relation. He he was working on a movement company. They move and uh, you know deliver things, and I hired him for because I changed houses. So and now you know, uh, being from the same culture, I asked, how are you doing? How is it going? And uh, yes, uh, I'm not surprised. He said very well. Now I speak really good Dutch. I started work, and uh, because of the work, I'm better in language. I'm meeting more Dutch people. So in short, Melissa, with the passage of time, I believe if we if we make a follow up for this uh, mm -hmm. research. We will find that with the passage of time, uh, more and more uh, people will be uh, integrated uh, because of you know how life goes, how work they start working. They, yeah, more people move to the Netherlands. So uh, yeah, I believe if we do another study, I think more and more we will discover that yeah, it's alleviated this uh, impact. Yes, great. Thank you so much. And I see that yeah. Sarah has her hand up. So go ahead, Sarah. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Mohamed. That was really interesting. Um, I also work with uh, young people and I'm really interested in this relationship between uh, mobility and also digital practices and how it it shapes uh, young people's experiences of, of mobility and attachment or in, um, engagement with the homeland. So I was wondering, because you talked about that at the beginning of your presentation as well, um, whether you could say a bit more about this relationship with mobility and you you um, thought about this in terms of uh, place as route and routes. So could you like bring out this a bit more? Of course. So uh, also, if we go deeper in the in the previous uh, knowledge and, and literature review, we see that uh, studies show that people uh, develop more place attachment to places where uh, they spend longer uh, periods of their time. So the relation is as follows. The longer you live in a place, the stronger your attachment might be to it. At the same time, uh, the place as routes, uh, the nature of the experience in that place plays a big role in uh, how you uh, formulate or develop your attachment to that place. It was a successful uh, experience, for example, the example of a PhD in the UK, that place will uh, hold the meanings of success, development, personal experience, good experience, and you uh, are more likely to develop a uh, better attachment to it versus if you, uh, some of the interviewees, by the way, mentioned that they spent some months in Lebanon as a transitional country to leave, some of them spent some months in Turkey as transitional country to migrate to Europe. And they highlighted that they avoid even uh, hearing or looking at news about these places because they had very bad experiences. It symbolizes failure, it symbolizes displacement for them. And in that regard, the attachment to the place as routes is uh, very low and because of the experience happened in that uh, in that place, so this is how uh, yeah mobility and link to the to the experience of place attachment. I hope that uh, yeah gives some uh, ideas to you. Great, thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Hi. Hi, go ahead, Julia. Yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> Hi, Mohamed. Thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. Um, I have uh, a question, uh, a couple of questions. Um, since you didn't mention um, policy recommendations, do you have any uh, policy implications for this research? Uh, and also, I was wondering if you uh, ever continued or expanded um, this study? And if not, what maybe potential other you know, um, directions you think this study could take, uh, if you could expand it. Um, maybe I was thinking, I don't know, the impact on those who remained in Syria, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let <laughs> me you. answer the first one, policy recommendations. 
uh, it wasn't in the thesis, but it was on, on my notes and uh, yeah, my thoughts as well. Uh, the main uh, policy recommendation, which is also, I think, touched upon by other scholars, is uh, the policy of the Netherlands, and in particular COA, which is the uh, organization responsible for uh, hosting uh, Syrian refugees and refugees in general, uh, in not uh, gathering all uh, same nationalities in the same camps and in the same cities, because after you leave a camp as a refugee, you will be assigned to a city to live in and some neighborhoods in, in certain cities. As a refugee, you get a social house and so on. Uh, it will be highly recommended for the government and for the Kuwan cooperation of the government to try to spread all the refugees all over the cities and, and the places in the Netherlands just to avoid the problem of integration because as long as more people from the same culture from the same country coming uh, migrants uh, living together it, it was noticed that it's uh, more challenging to get integrated socially and on other levels with the society so the more you spread i i think more scandinavian countries are uh, adopting that policy nowadays they try to spread uh, migrants as much as possible or refugees in this case so they inter, uh, interact with locals, they integrate better. So I think this is one of the main policy recommendations in this regard. And uh, regarding your question about following up, what uh, Melissa asked was also very uh, related. Uh, it, it will be very interesting. I didn't, unfortunately, uh, follow up on the study, but it will be very interesting to see now, after the passage of four or five years, how they're doing, how much... They integrated and uh, especially in the language and uh, work uh, yeah situation so who knows maybe sometime i will uh, follow up on this thank you yeah i was also thinking about for example the impact of covid like how covid influenced this kind of that's, that's also a big deal because yeah everything was online right even yeah. for locals and migrants and refugees so yeah that's another uh, big big topic uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any, yes, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I have another question. Um, Because from your presentation, it sounded like this contact was mostly with like existing ties they had in, in Syria with friends and family. But I'm really curious whether you in your research also observed that um, Syrians in the Netherlands use digital media to connect to new um, to new people, and maybe just to give a bit of background, why why I'm asking is I'm um, in my research I did research with young people of Guinean background who who live in Belgium um, and but yeah grow up with like these ties between um, or these relationships to um, people and places in Ghana. And I observed that they also used social media to reach out to new people. But in that context, it was also then often as a way to build up networks that also affect how they themselves experience um, visits to the homeland. And of course, that is quite different in the case of Syria. So I'm really curious whether um, digital media and your research um, was also used for new con contacts and um, yeah what if so what were the, the reasons behind that maybe yes. in Syria but also maybe in the Netherlands because you talked about that virtual Syria. Thank you for the question uh, indeed uh, the interviews actually touched upon uh, areas like that it can be in two directions the first one is the social uh, direction I would not say uh, the respondent were trying to expand their relations as social relations from here to Syria, but more in cases where, for example, uh, one respondent was saying that he was searching for marriage. So in, in Syria, they call it searching for a girl. This is a term, so it's, it's not, uh, you know. So uh, he deployed his social network in Syria to find a suitable uh, bride for him. So he can marry, then he can sponsor her. So this expansion of uh, more and more people, uh, in my case, in the case of this study, was limited in the social settings to uh, yeah, marriage or uh, things like that. The other direction was also remittances. A uh, big part of 
communications also uh, talk about remittances back home. Uh, the situation in Syria every year is worse. So a lot of uh, migrants and refugees send back money. And for that, you need, uh, I would say, they call it a dealer because uh, formal uh, channels is not available for some reasons. The government in Syria recently opened the way to uh, receive from Europe, but they will deduct like 40% of the amount you send. So it's ridiculous. That's why people keep talking to each other and telling each other, I have this person here, I have this person there. Then they contact to make connections to deliver, smuggle some money via Turkey, via, but yeah, smuggle is a, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the term correct, but irregular transfer of money, I would say. So that needs a network, social network, because these people who, who transfer irregularly, uh, like uh, have a network in Syria. So this were, was the case. Okay, if there aren't any other questions, I think we can wrap up there. Thank you again so much, Mohammed, for, for joining us this week. And just as a reminder to uh, um, those of you who are interested, we have two more migration seminars in two weeks. And keep a lookout. Well, on the UNU Merit website, they're already there with all of the information about them. And we will also be able be sure to be posting them on social media. So thanks again, everyone, for being in here and for the active participation. And I hope to see many of you in two weeks. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Yeah. Bye. Thank you.